In this lesson, we're going to go ahead and look at what value could give us a certain probability. So we're going to get location from probabilities on a normal distribution. And speaking of which, what kind of dinosaur do we have down to the right? Why, that is a normal curvosaurus. Ha, ha, ha. You get the normal distribution. It looks like one. Anyways, so let's start with an example. An adult male uh, heights are on average 70 inches, 5 foot 10, with a standard deviation of 4 inches. How tall must an adult male be to be in the top 10% of height? So what does that mean? Top 10%, that means the right side of the curve, I think that's right for you, would be 10%. Okay, so it's right there. And what value is that? 0 0.10, because we have an area of 1. All right. Now, what would be the area to the left? That would be 90% of the curve, or the area would be on the left of the curve. All right? And we'd have the 10% on the right. This is called the 90th percentile. So what we can do is we can actually go backwards on the table, and instead of using the row and column headers, we're actually going to look at values in the table. So let's go ahead and show you what that means. So here's a table that's in your notes, and if I look for 90%, 90% is down on these higher values here, and in fact, it looks like it's somewhere about probably right there. Okay, so what z-score would give me the 90th percentile? It would be 1.2, and since it's in the .08 column, 1.28. So that's the z-score. So now I can tell you that the z-score right there is 1.28, which means if z is 1.28, and I know z equals the value minus the mean over the standard deviation, I can just go ahead and substitute in. I know 1.28 from the table. I don't know what value gives me the top 10%. That's what I'm looking for. We'll call it x. And the mean is 70. That was given to us, and the standard deviation is 4. I can put a 1 under the left side, and you're probably used to cross multiplying. So 4 times 1.28 equals 1 times x minus 70, which gives me 5.13 equals x minus 70. Adding 70 to both sides, my x value is 75.13 inches. So I would expect anyone with 75.13 inches who was 75.13 inches or taller to be in the top 10% of heights. So how about if they're in the top 5%? So top 5% is over here, which means that the green area to the left, that would be the 95th percentile because they have to add up to 100. So let's go to the table. We're going to look up 0.95. Looking around, I can immediately see there's 0.95. It's probably halfway between these two values. So it would be 1.6, and halfway between those two head headers up there would be 1.645, because it's between 1.64 and 1.65. So I would use a z-score of 1.645. So now that I know z is 1.645 right there, then I can go back to my z-score formula. z equals value minus the mean divided by standard deviation. So 1.645 equals x minus 70 over 4. If I cross multiply, I get 6.58 equals x minus 70. So all males that are 76.58 inches or taller, according to the normal model, would be in the top 5% of male heights. So now we have a tomato box filler is designed to get an average fill of 80 ounces. My dad actually designed tomato box fillers, so this is for him, with a standard deviation of 4 ounces. What will 95% of boxes weigh at least? So 95% of boxes will weigh at least what? Well, the weight is. Um, that means I'm looking for the cutoff weight, which is below 95% of the weights. All right, It's below 95% of the heaviest weights, which are these weights here. Well, that's actually in the fifth percentile there. 
So I'm going to go look up 0.05 in the table. And if we go ahead and look for it, 0.05, you'll notice if you're going on the table, it's where the negative Z scores are. And it's somewhere around here, it's right there. It's pretty much halfway between these two values, which is negative 1.6. So it's between negative 1.64 and negative 1.65, so negative 1.645. Now this is just the negative of, we got, of what we got for the 95th percentile. Why? Well, there's our 95th percentile. Basically, we're just looking at the two ends of the table that are the 5%, so there, it's symmetric. So if you got positive 1.645 for the top 5%, for the bottom 5%, you'd expect the negative 1.645. So this makes sense. So now that we know Z is negative 1.645, can we find the value? Sure. Uh, we'll say Z equals value minus mean. Go ahead and substitute in the negative 1.645, the mean, and the standard deviation, and we're going to find the value of X. Uh, put a 1 underneath so we can cross multiply. And we got negative 6.58 ounces equals x minus 80 ounces. Add 80 to both sides, and I get x is 73.42 ounces, which means 95% of boxes weigh at least 73.42 ounces, according to the normal model. Now let's say the company wants to have 95% of the boxes weigh at least 76 ounces. Well, that's a little bit more than the 73.42 we had just now. So we're going to be shifting the weights up, which means our new weight is going to be an old weight plus a constant. So my new weight is supposed to be 76. My old uh, weight was 73.42. So my constant, I'm shifting all the weights up by 2.58. So what does that mean due to the mean? Well, we're actually going to say the new mean equals the old mean plus a constant. Remember when we talked about shifting data, when we add a constant, that does affect the mean. So my new mean is 80 ounces plus a 2.58 ounces, which means it's 82.58 ounces. So we increase the weights up to that. By the way, your standard deviation, because we're shifting the whole thing by a constant, it stays the same because your shape is not going to change if you just shift the, the shape. The spread is the same. So now uh, we know that they can slow down the pr production line to minimize variability. If they want 95% of the boxes to weigh at least 76 ounces but still have a mean of 80, so this is a different situation. We're going to have a mean of 80, 95% of the boxes need to weigh at least 76 ounces, what should they set the standard deviation to? So assume they can adjust the precision in the spread. So, so Z is still negative 1.645 because we're in the fifth percentile. We still have the formula Z equals value minus the mean divided by standard deviation. And we're going to go ahead and substitute in. This time you'll notice that the thing I don't know is the standard deviation. I know the value I want and I know the mean and I know the z-score. So I'm going to go ahead and put a 1 underneath this and cross multiply and I get the new standard deviation should be 2.43 ounces. So almost half or about half but not quite as far down as half and that would give you the value they wanted. So let's say we have an ice cream filler puts an average of 32 ounces in a quart size container with a standard deviation of 1.5 ounces. The container has enough space to hold up to 34 ounces. They want less than 2% of their containers to be overfilled. So how should they adjust the average to have less than 2% of the containers overfilled? Well, the mean is 32 ounces, but we're going to want a new mean. So we're going to adjust it and we have to figure out how. We know the standard deviation, the spread is 1.5 ounces and we know we want less than 2% of containers overfilled. Where is overfilled going to happen? On the high or the low? It's going to happen on the high. So it's this area right here is 0.02. So how much area is to the left? 0.98. So the cups with 34 ounces or more 
are going to be in the 98th percentile. Because remember, overfill means at the 34 ounces. If you're right at 34, you're at the point of overfilling. So now that we know we're in the 98th percentile, let's go ahead and look at the table and find the z-score. So uh, we're looking for 0.98, so it's going to be pretty high somewhere in here. And in fact, there it is. This is the closest one to 98. That one's pretty close too. Uh, 2.05 looks like is the z-score. So z equals 2.05. And if I know that, I can go ahead and use the formula z equals value minus the new mean divided by the standard deviation. 2.05 equals 34 because that's the point where we would overfill it minus my new mean divided by 1.5 because that's my standard deviation. And if after cross multiplying, I get 3.075 equals 34 minus my new mean. And when I solve that, I get that my new mean should be 30.925 ounces, which means the machine's filling overfilling more than 2% and we have to back it down just over an ounce. Now instead, if they'd rather have tighter control and they can slow down the production line, what would standard deviation would they need to have less than 2% of the containers be overfilled while still keeping the average at 32 ounces? So let's write down what we know. Our z-score is still 2.05 because we're still looking at the 98th percentile. The mean is 32 ounces, but it's a standard deviation I don't know. Let's go ahead and bring out our formula, which is z equals value minus mean divided by standard deviation. We have 2.05 equals 34, because that's where the overflow point is, minus my mean, which is 32. SD, I don't know. So I'm going to go ahead and cross multiply, and I get 2.05 times the SD equals 2. So the new standard deviation should be 0.98 ounces, which is less than half of what we had before for our spread. So if we could slow down the production line and reduce the variability by over half, then we could achieve this goal. So one last thing, we're going to go ahead and see when are we allowed to use a normal distribution. So there's something called the nearly normal condition. And in order to use the normal model, we must either be told that the scores are nearly normal or we should analyze a histogram and or what's called a normal probability plot. So I'm going to go ahead and revisit the hikes that I did in an earlier lesson. And here's the data. So in this table, what I've started to do is pull together the relative frequencies. And you can see they're actually already calculated here for most of the data points because I didn't see the point in making you do every single one of these values. Well, let's go ahead and work through about three of them ourselves, all right? So the first point, um, the day I hiked uh, three miles, that was only one day out of 30. So the relative frequency is one out of 30. That would be 0 0.0333. I like three sig figs or 3.33%. That's rounded, of course. The percentile is pretty, oh, well, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, the day I hike five miles is the same as is the day I hike six miles. Now, the, the day I hike three miles, that is in the 3.33 percentile, we'll call it, because 3.33% of my days were at three miles or lower, okay? When I hike five days, so that's two days out of the 30, we're at five miles or lower. So you're going to find out the easy way to do it is just to add the relative frequencies. So 3.33 plus 3.33. By the way, there's some extra threes in there. And when we round, it's 6.67 roughly. Then finally, I hike another day of six miles. So the relative frequency, while it's 3.33%, the percentile is now up to 10%. And further down in the table, you can see uh, the different percentiles for all those values. So to find the expected z-score, what I'm going to do is pull up the table for these percentiles, which is right here. 3.33%, so that's uh, that should be pretty low. I want 3%. There it is. Three, that's close to 3.33%. 3 
and that's like negative 1.83. Then I'm going to look up 6.67%, which is roughly here, or negative 1.50. Finally, I'm going to look up 10%, um, and that would be closest right there, which is at negative 1.28. And so all these other values that I have here, I went ahead and looked up the percentiles for it on a table and put them in and updated, it, except for one, the 100 percentile. So um, basically, we can assume that when you're at, three point, uh, at 100 percentile, it's at 3.5. And if for some reason you're at the 0th percentile, we'll use negative 3.5. That's just a guideline. So. For the distribution to be considered normal, if we want to check it, the normal probability plot should be linear, and I'm about to do one. And the histogram, ideally you should also plot that, should be symmetric and bell-shaped. So to create a normal probability plot, we calculate the percentile for each value, determine the expected z-score for that percentile, assume that 0% is negative 3.5, and 100% is positive 3.5. And then you make a scatter plot of the data versus the z-score. So in this case, here, is, here are the values, roughly, and here are the expected z-scores. Then you graph to determine if the distribution of miles hiked is approximately normal. So it should be linear for a normal distribution, but this one clearly has some curve to it. So this is not a linear plot. My hikes are not really very normally distributed because I've got some really low values for the days. I was like, oh, let me take, take it easy, take a short day. So what can probability plots look like for different density curves? For curves that are skewed left, like this one right here, and you can tell there's the mean and there's the median and the light blue, it tends to be curved down, all right? When it's nice and symmetric and bell-shaped, it should be roughly linear. It doesn't have to be perfectly linear, but it should be close to linear. And then if you're really seeing some curvature up, then that typically indicates that it is skewed right. So again, to determine normality, you can create the probability plot using the z-scores for the percentiles of the values plotted against the actual x-scores.